see when you're on mute, by the way. I'm not sure if you realize by now. Oh, no wonder nobody's laughing. We're missing all your jokes. Yeah, that was bad. It was all good stuff. Dick. <laughs> all right. Thanks for joining. Today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Microsoft's recent purchase of Xamarin. And what, what that means for enterprise mobility. Uh, here with us today, we have uh, Propelix partner, Eric Carlson. And nice, Steve. Hello. We have mobile strategists, Nitin Bhatia, Glenn Gruber, and integration architect, Tyler Jensen. There. All right. Now I just got to do this little intro here. Hello and welcome to Device Squad, the Propellix Enterprise Mobility Podcast. Device Squad, fighting crimes against enterprise mobility around the world. Bad UI, frustrating user experiences, poorly conceived mobile strategies. We defeat them all. This podcast series will cover all aspects of enterprise mobility, including strategy, development, design, testing, and more. My name is Steve Brickman. I'm a mobile strategist and UX architect with Propelix. First, a brief history of the company. Founded in 2011, Propelix is a mobile strategy consultancy helping enterprises worldwide devise true mobile strategies and develop world-class mobile applications across all industry verticals. Propelix clients include large companies such as Amway, Bright Horizons, Bank of Montreal, Dubai Airports, Family Dollar, DLL, Cintas, Merck, and many more. Propelix menu of services includes eight different mobile kickstarts covering everything from mobile strategy and road mapping to MCOE, to UI UX design, to mobile testing, uh, along with soup to nuts app design, development, and support. Additionally, Propelix offers three homegrown enterprise mobile products. Ben, so you you were the one who uh, pushed for this podcast conversation roundtable. So why don't you start off? Tell us, uh, why is this Microsoft purchase important? Why should we care? What's the big deal? Well, I mean, I think that there's a, a couple of layers to this. Obviously, Microsoft has... Uh, under uh, Nadella has said that mobile and the cloud are key tent poles to how they're, you know, how they want to grow the business going forward. And this is obviously another big step in terms of trying to make that happen. I mean, there was a lot of work, obviously, on Windows 10, um, you know, from a device and operating system perspective. But there's always been the challenge to get the developer community engaged in building apps for Windows 10 devices, but also just building apps on platforms controlled by Microsoft. Um, and they have been relatively unsuccessful um, in that regard, other than when they've given incentives to certain uh, companies to try and build versions of their apps for on the Windows platform. And I think that now, uh, there's always been a lot of talk because of the fact that Xamarin has been based on C Sharp, um, you know, that, that it's a natural fit to be acquired by Microsoft at some point. Uh, but now that they have a platform that can leverage a lot of, you know, the, a large community of developers with uh, C Sharp skills, but also allow them to use those to continue to build for the dominant mobile platforms of iOS and Android. Um, you know, th this helps support really more from a, a developer and platform perspective. In my view, you know, probably more than anything else, it might have a residual effect of making it easier for more people to want to start developing uh, for Windows using that set of tools. But we'll have to see about that going forward. I think that's another part of the conversation. Yeah, you know, this is Eric. I, I think it's interesting because you know, even as as the role of the operating system, even the role of like Windows 10 becomes less and less important. Um, and as more and more individuals are using mobile devices, and since mobile, since Microsoft really hasn't claimed any significant portion, like you said, of that mobile device, that footprint, their role, right, and, and becoming more of a services cloud-based company, as you said, and being able to obviously own the server side of the house and, and being able to be more of a processor and then being obviously being as, as really a development lead, um, in the industry, I think it's I think it's pretty interesting to move away from building for Windows only to being able to be a development and an inter, in a services and cloud-based firm that can that can deliver across really any platform, right? Um, 
and I know that the like from a Windows 10 perspective, and you're and you're kind of competing with OS X, giving giving those operating systems away for free, and you have you know are people still willing to pay ninety nine dollars a year for a new operating system for a, a Windows PC? I think that market is kind of disappearing. I think it's just interesting to to be less of a you know that they need to own the whole stack and become obviously somebody who can deliver from a development and cloud based service perspective across really any end user computing device. Yeah, I think the timing is really interesting. Just a month ago or so, um, Microsoft CEO, you know, admitted that the Windows market was, was so small as to be unsustainable. I think the figure was uh, 1.7% in the third quarter of 2015. Do you think that Microsoft is going to abandon Windows Mobile and pursue this software-based direction? Or how do you think this relates to, to the failure of Windows Mobile? I don't think they'll. I, I I don't think they'll abandon it. In fact, what I feel the purchase of Xamarin would do is further incentivize the the developers to build for mobile ten. So so their whole idea is, hey, you're building it for iOS, and it takes twenty percent additional work. So if if we think about this whole uh, ecosystem, it's got it's got three different players, right? It's a three sided ecosystem. There's there's Microsoft sitting on one side, there's developers sitting on the other side, and then there's a consumer sitting on the other side. And consumers are going to try and purchase devices that have the most apps. Uh, developers are gonna to try to build for um, operating systems that have the maximum amount of exposure, and manufacturers obviously want uh, kind of a piece of that. So, so I think the Xamarin kind of fits in right in the middle of that to where now they can go back to the developers and say, well, you know, you've, you've maximized your exposure, and just 20% more might get you into a Windows store, which may then incentivize consumers to possibly, if, you know, that's not the only thing, but that is a good thing to, you know, if, if you've got more apps in your app store, then it might be one more thing to, to why people may want to buy your phones. Yeah, even, even from a developer perspective, same type of three-legged store, right? You have you have developers that are really Java focused. So you have, you know, obviously building for Eclipse and building native Android apps. You have a significant amount of developers that are that are Objective C slash maybe now growing Swift type developers with that under their belt. And you have this giant .NET and and C sharp you know development community, like Glenn mentioned before, that now this purchase gives total legitimacy to. Mm -hmm. um, and Xamarin existed before, right? But it wasn't from Microsoft. And so now I have a a platform that is not going anywhere that enables a huge development population to be able to deliver apps um, on three or four major architectures, um, which which really is not available in obviously an Objective-C Swift perspective, and it's clearly not available in a, in a Java perspective the way that it is here. Um, and you have, and then you have, I guess, a fourth piece. You have like the JavaScript tools, which is something like Accelerator or other types of tools that allow you to do that. But, but I don't even think that that knowledge base, when it comes to mobile developers and those skill sets, are even close to say a .NET, you know, or, or C sharp development environment or um, community of developers that are just, just a huge door opens. I think for that skill set. Yeah, that space has matured over the last ten years. You know, Visual Basic. When, when they decided to move away from Visual Basic .NET to, to C Sharp .NET and, and have that as, a, as their primary uh, language for the compilers and stuff like that. So that definitely now looking at kind of the .NET frameworks that have been around for, for a good seven, eight, maybe even more uh, years, uh, putting mobile on top of such a solid framework versus looking at um, some of these new JavaScript libraries that, that are almost immature, compared to the uh, the maturity of the .NET framework. I, I think even from a stability perspective, we, uh, I, I, would, I would like to think that we may have better mobile apps that are easier to develop, uh, that are easier to debug, that are easier to, to, to do a lot of things just from a developer perspective. I think it's a very interesting play for Microsoft in that, um, of course, as, as was mentioned, uh, their revenue streams for uh, operating systems are diminishing significantly. Their revenue streams for their commercial uh, commercial software uh, systems, such as databases, uh, enterprise um, uh, systems, etc., those are still fairly strong. Their their commercial licensing revenue is about fifty six or fifty seven percent of their their total revenue. 
right now, and uh, that that will continue. Their operating system revenue will continue to go down. I wouldn't be surprised in the future if you see Windows Server even uh, operating system licenses uh, down at virtually zero cost or very low cost. And right. one of one of one of Microsoft's uh, strategies, I think, here since Satya Nadella came in, is that he does not like like Steve Ballmer. He does not he does not have this this sort of monopolistic view of uh, the operating system being the key to controlling the world and instead has enabled uh, people like uh, Scott Guthrie, who heads the uh, server development division, to really embrace all developers. And that's when, that's when Azure started putting Linux available into Azure, et cetera. And that embracing of that whole developer community and bringing in developers from every platform and, and, and embracing them and providing them with the greatest tools and the greatest support for the tools allows Microsoft to get this great big huge uh, infrastructure of developers building software that relies on and utilizes all of those back-end enterprise systems where I think the majority of their profits are going to come from uh, in the future. Um, rather than the desktop apps, uh, the, the, the desktop operating systems, et cetera. You're going to see a lot of, the, and even now, I have, a, I have a friend that works with Microsoft, even now their licensing structures for desktop operating systems for enterprises with large numbers, it's extraordinarily inexpensive to put Windows on the desktop, which is why they're still quite dominant in the enterprise marketplace. Um, not so much in, you know, because obviously PC sales are, are going down uh, for homes and consumers. People just don't want that big box sitting sitting underneath their table in their dining room. But those PCs are still being deployed, even sometimes in virtual scenarios in the enterprise. And that enterprise game, I think, is where Microsoft sees their future. Um, and by by grabbing the all of the developers that they have and uh, enabling them to build mobile apps using the same tools, the same language some of the same testing uh, uh, tools that they've been using, et cetera, uh, and the Visual Studio uh, 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 development environment, which, you know, hand, uh, hands down is, is honestly the best development environment available and the best support. Now, there are, there are people who will argue that, but, but I'll argue strongly that it, that it really is the best IDE available um, and has really great support so I think that the, that they've been trying to work this deal with Xamarin for a long time because Xamarin provides them with that strategic piece that they have not owned before. And it also strengthens Xamarin's play because those who have, have kind of looked at Xamarin as a small startup and not really enterprise ready are not going to be able to make that, uh, make that argument, at least not for much longer. Right. Even Visual yeah. Studio out for OSX and, and knowing that obviously Xamarin has an, an OSX ID as well, you can kind of see that clearly there's going to be a, a multi-platform development environment and the extension of Visual Studio to, to other platforms. I mean, even the fact that there's right. Visual Studio that runs on Linux is clearly a step <laughs> where where that dependency of, of being a full stack yeah. Microsoft um, and a platform is obviously not important to Microsoft. Right. And, and one thing I would say, I mean, Tyler, like those are all really, really good points. But, but the other part of this that I think can be critical is, now, again, that focus on the developer and focusing on all the supporting environment rather than the desktop OS probably bodes pretty well for your know, continued focus on Intune, you know, in the EMM space. And, you know, because now they can really bring all of the plumbing together for the IT organizations to develop on who cares what the device platform is almost anymore. Right. Uh, we can develop on it. We can uh, support it and manage all the, all those different devices. So I think it, it does dovetail very well with what they're trying to do to, you know, catch up from a feature perspective with, with Intune to the mobile irons and air watches uh, of the world. But I think that this just further supports that story too, you know, and their focus on the enterprise. Yeah, I, I think they're mostly realists there. I, don't, I think they realize they're not going to capture the mobile device market. They're not going to sell, you know, several billion uh, Windows phone devices. That's just uh, simply not going to happen. Um, there will be a really small uh, uh, number of devices and some enterprises that deploy some of the devices, like the new HP device that's coming out that 
you know, that bills itself as a, as a, a, a mobile uh, desktop machine. Um, you know, I, there may be a few people that, that purchase that, but, but uh, like you're saying, Glenn, the, the, real, the real win for them, I believe, is going to be in capturing and locking down that enterprise market so that they can continue to sell uh, you know, uh, database server licenses, um, the CRM and, and other, other uh, dynamics licenses that they have, which are extraordinarily profitable. Uh, even, even, even uh, you know, SharePoint. Uh, is an extraordinarily profitable uh, uh, piece of software. Um, even for those of us who love to hate it, uh, there are enterprises that, that rely very heavily on that product. And uh, the licensing for that brings Microsoft a significant amount of revenue. Yeah, I don't know what anyone else thinks, but I'll throw this out. Does, you know, the Surface Pros uh, and, and the, you know, the Lumia phone hardware, do these become kind of like a vanity project? You know, for for Microsoft, if this is not you know, if you think about the effort involved in uh, building and developing and supporting hardware, you know, it's it's one thing where you look at Google's Nexus as kind of their vanity project um, to create the references, for the reference architectures for uh, other OEMs, um, but no one else is really picking up on Windows uh, as a Phone, yeah, none of the other homes are really picking up on on Windows 10 as a smartphone platform. And if you know, frankly, if you're the enterprise, and you know, why would you want to focus that much on investing in building you know applications for a Surface you know uh, Pro, uh, which has one set of uh, UI um, concepts when you know from a if you're looking at a mobile device strategy you know all of your smartphone devices are going to be either ios or android or at least the you know great great majority at least into the foreseeable future are going to be that way that use completely different ui paradigms um you know this this almost weakens the hand for this microsoft developer community to want to continue to support and build products for you know, mobile devices from Microsoft now that they can use that skill to build on devices that people already have. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I don't know if Microsoft will ever really be a successful hardware hardware system maker and, and seller. Right now their their revenue model is a is almost eighty percent software um, and twenty percent other stuff and, and that twenty percent other stuff is probably ninety nine percent Xbox. Uh, in terms of revenue, you know, I, they may continue to build the devices. Um, I don't know if they'll ever make money on those. They, I think that uh, their their larger play here with Xamarin is to continue building their enterprise software dominance and being able to sell into that market. Um, even even the the recent news of of uh, Microsoft uh, allowing and setting up uh, Oracle uh, within Azure is a uh, pretty big news Th those those two organizations have been uh, diametrically opposed to one another and in, in, in some case in some respects um and competed with one another in the database marketplace but it kind of shows i think such a difference in direction and and purpose in in trying to really push the azure platform the the back-end systems the the enterprise systems that's where they're going to continue to make their bread and butter and i think that they have their their sales organizations and, and development uh, development and support organizations directed at that at that market. They are prob I don't think they'll ever be successful in the in the consumer market uh, that that we at least the market that we see, and especially not in the in the hardware device market. I just don't see that happening. And uh, I'm just wondering how how do you think this is going to affect uh, Apple and Swift use? I don't know how it will affect them. I do know that I've, I've heard from a number of uh, friends who are uh, .NET developers. Uh, you know, I've, I've grown up in the .NET infrastructure uh, uh, ecosystem, essentially, and, and um, there are a number of, of, of individuals that I know that are in the .NET stack. They are super excited about the Xamarin acquisition because it allows them, and hopefully it gives them access to the, the, the tools and the platform without having to spend the inordinate price that Xamarin has, has charged. While it's not the most expensive cross-platform 
mobile app development system uh, out there. It's almost the most expensive and, and um, most small developers, especially if they're gonna try to do it on their own, they just really can't afford those tools. Um, and in Microsoft shops, they're, they're price sensitive. Uh, so even the enterprises have been, I think a little bit hesitant to invest in those, those tools. And, uh, and so because of that, uh, uh, you haven't seen Xamarin penetrate the .NET development market like it, like it really should. And for example, Xamarin claims to have 1.3 million uh, developers, while estimates are they're sending more from 8 to 15 million .NET developers in total. So that's, you know, they, they've got uh, essentially one-tenth of that number. Uh, and uh, you know if they can double that or triple that or quadruple that to and, and all of those .NET developers start adopting that platform and start building mobile apps, that could be transformative in terms of just developers and mindshare around building mobile apps, both for iOS and Android, um, regardless of what happens with the, uh, the the Windows Windows 10 mobile platform. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the the consumer side of this. I, I... I don't know if that's really the Microsoft play here. I mean, being able to pick up those developers and I could see that being a, a little bit of a motivation. It has to seem for me that this is 100% enterprise mobility play, right? The idea that that picking up the ability in Xamarin to be able to allow .NET C-sharp developers to develop for iOS and Android in the public app store, I guess using, using Azure services and things like that is a, clearly a benefit and a, a portion of that. But I would think that also having the ability to kind of work towards an, the idea of having almost a responsive native application type of program where I could develop for any screen size across multiple platforms to say, I'm going to allow an enterprise developer to build an application that does X, Y, and Z, and then they can run that on a Windows 10 device, or I could run that in an iOS device off the same code base with different UI off the same IDE. That yeah. I could see as being... A, a huge area and then obviously using the Azure platform and you have the MBAS capabilities of that and everything else. Right. Um, and then like you, like you said, um, Glenn, in terms of the manageability of that, you start bringing in security pieces and you now you have a, a single platform to deliver before, you know, obviously 10, five, seven years ago, you had a single platform uh, from an ID perspective to deliver anything on a Microsoft platform. Now I'm working towards building an IDE and a platform that I can deliver applications really across almost any end computing device. Um, yeah regardless of who who built the hardware or what OS is on there. And I think that I can see is a, is a pretty good vision. Um, I don't know, I, honestly, I don't know who else is in a position to even do that right now. I don't, I don't know either. Xamarin, Xamarin got a, a really good jump start on that with their Xamarin forms, uh, uh, which essentially, even, even, even when Xamarin started, they, uh, you could build a lot of code uh, that was shared, but the, the, code for specific uh, uh, UIs, uh, iOS and Android, had to be separated. And Xamarin Forms creates a uh, uh, sort of a native control set that converts and, 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 and uh, compiles to use native controls. So you look, you get a, a look and a native look and feel because it is, it is uh, generating native controls through this Xamarin Forms. So it allows a, a they claim, uh, and I've seen a, a few examples, uh, you know, 80 to 90 percent shared UI code, which is pretty transformative. And if they can, if they can continue that. If Microsoft continues to do that, and they, and they expand that so that uh, you can get a build for iOS, Android, and uh, Windows 10, with very little to to no uh, uh, differences in your code for the, the UI side. That's very transformative, and I don't know if there's anyone in the marketplace besides Microsoft, like you said, uh, that has the ability to throw the resources at that problem and make that problem solvable, because that is an extraordinarily difficult problem to solve, as we all know, as we see the difficulties and challenges in building uh, uh, apps that uh, should act and behave in exactly the same way across different native platforms it just is very challenging to do that now given that it'll probably never work <laughs> <laughs> it may, so, it may not. So, it might always be <laughs> it's a good idea but i mean we always i mean when we when we do a workshop so I mean, obviously we talk a lot about that obviously I'm, I'm trying to build an experience on a specific device and usually that experience cannot be should not be the same and would not be the same based on where i'm using that device or the context of that use or 
the business process and everything else, right? And, and the whole, that kind of goes against our whole kind of Propelix philosophy of, of not treating mobile as a separate screen, right? That it's, it should be something that is fitting a business and a use case. And we're hopefully trying to simplify processes and all this type of stuff. So, which was kind of our whole thing around when Microsoft was doing it on the Windows 10 side to say, I can use the same code base and I can build it for a Windows phone and tablets. And we always, and, or for a Windows PC. And we always said, well, that's fine. Like it's nice from a technology perspective, but are you, are we actually executing the use case? Are we solving problems? Are we making life simpler and all that type of stuff? And so that is not necessarily a challenge of the technology so much. It's just the challenge of, of kind of giving, this is giving control to technology teams to say, Hey, we're mobile ready when all we're really doing is creating awful UI on small screens. Um, but that, again, that's not Microsoft's issue. That's really an Im the implementation of those. Yeah, it, it's very possible that that could be the end result of that effort. Uh, no doubt about it. Yeah, so do you think we'll see like a watering down as a result of this across platforms where, where everybody will start to look the same, all these apps will start to look the same, and they'll all start to suffer as a result? I'm not sure, uh, this is Glenn, I'm, I'm not sure that um, we will, only because you're seeing such distinct... I don't want to say personalities, but I'll say personalities. You know, when when you look at the UI conventions for how things live in iOS versus you know Android with material design and how they're continuing to evolve that, and then you know the very different UI style guide. If like I, I still always think that it's you know it'll be taken poorly by whoever's using which OS if you present an app that doesn't seem to fit in the rest of the surroundings. Right. So I, I do think that, you know, you may see more of it. I just don't think it'll be well received uh, by the user, you know, if you do. Yeah, and keep in mind, even even with Xamarin and, and probably other plays in the same space, uh, the Xamarin Forms, um, um, quote unquote, shared native control system uh, or infrastructure is not uh, is not required. You, know, you don't have to use that in order to use Xamarin. You can still build the, the separate individual unique UI and, and have those individual distinct experiences. So like Eric said, it's really going to be up to the development teams. Uh, there may be some, uh, some teams that attempt to use the Xamarin forms for, um, for enterprise apps and uh, get a good enough is enough kind of thing. And and, and having worked for large enterprises, uh, building internal internal software for use by uh, by employees, I can tell you that that is often perfectly fine. Uh, uh, and um, some of the very worst pieces of software ever built are internal enterprise apps, as you well know. Uh, and and we probably all had to had to eat that dog food at one point or another. Uh, so. Uh, there, there is a very much a, a cost benefit uh, uh, scenario there, and a lot of enterprises will go for that easy, lower cost, uh, lower hanging fruit uh, kind of thing. And you'll get a lot of enterprise apps that probably look like crap and get the job done, and nobody uh, who's paying the bills are, is going to really care about that. Right. Uh, with with respect to consumer apps and uh, native you know experiences that is a whole different story uh, because as soon as you start releasing those apps in the world um, you, you're going to get a whole you know a whole different picture in terms of feedback etc uh, and what's what looks good and what doesn't and if it looks like crap your app is going to get killed in the marketplace and nobody's going to adopt it the other thing you think just away from the the Xamarin platform itself, which we've talked mostly about, is just Microsoft picking up the insights and the test cloud stuff. I, I don't think, at least I don't know, I, I don't remember Microsoft having anything similar to a mobile test cloud, like what uh, Amazon did with the device farm or like a Perfecto mobile or other types of things. I, I thought Microsoft was like a partner with Perfecto or something like that, but but that is a huge purchase as well. Um, yeah. The test clouds, it's, I mean, it's, it's growing. I know it's still a little bit new, but it... Going in terms of its capabilities, it's well written. Um, I think that is a huge win for them to be able to extend that out and and be able to turn that into a a much larger test based system and also an insights. I don't I don't believe Microsoft have anything had anything related to to real time analytics of app usage other types of things where that was more partnership based as well. And now that's in house um, mm -hmm. across obviously all these platforms and everything else. Like those are those are also 
just really good additions um, that they're picking up as part of this as well. Agreed. How, how do you guys think that this bodes for competitors like Accelerator? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, like that, my first thought was that, you know, Accelerator was bought last month. This month we're seeing um, Xamarin. Uh, and, you know, Kony is kind of like the cheese stands alone. Like, yeah, I'm not even sure that there's anyone you know, to buy them at this point. And now instead of being, you know, a really good platform that's one of three smaller startup uh platforms on par, now I'm not sure where, where they go. And uh, it could be challenging for them. I think it's challenging for Accelerator as well. I mean, I know we talked a lot about who... I mean, we, I don't think anybody saw Xamarin going somewhere else besides Microsoft, right? I mean, we've talked about this for yeah. years and they made a, I think they made a strategic investment last year. Xamarin raised, I think, 54 million round C last year. And I thought they maybe had a round D, if I remember. Um, but we kind of, you know, it really made sense. Like that was a one true exit. Um, Axway coming out of nowhere with the Accelerator was a little bit surprising to us, right? I mean, we weren't sure exactly where they're going to go, but but I don't think actually it was on our list of, of potentials. But they have some, I think, market positioning challenges now. I think that with this purchase and with a strong development and developer base um, on the .NET C Sharp side, you have, you know, well, the world's largest or second largest cloud-based hosting and, and best provider now behind this. You have um, a significant amount of dollars um, for marketing and for for growing this, you have the integration with Visual Studio. Like you just you you're working against a, a pretty long line of of uh, deficiencies when you're you know um, writing your own IDE right or or writing your own uh, wrapping yeah. libraries and all those other types of things where you're competing against you know Microsoft and the Microsoft development team um, who can typically will be larger, will work faster, and other types of things. Um, and especially when you talk about test cloud and you have this analytics on top of it and you start looking at, you know, wrapping EMM and other types of things, it's gone from, you know, which we've always seen as a, a as an enterprise, I'm looking to build a platform of six or seven providers. And maybe two years ago, that was six or seven providers. Maybe now in 2016, it's three or four providers. And soon with this, you're looking at one. I think you're in a, you're in a tough spot in at least working in large enterprise businesses where you and I have it approved to say, you know, is my JavaScript based development team, is that enough of a differentiator um, for me to be able to pick um, Accelerator slash Axway versus, versus not? I was going to say, if you want to stay with uh, JavaScript, you have other choices now too, you know, IBM and Adobe. Sure. You know, yeah, which are JavaScript based and also come from large companies that have other components that are going to make sense for your business. Yeah, of course. I, I think it's de definitely different. It's just that that whole, you know, early, early industry piecemeal type of approach, right? I got to go find a testing package and I need to go do something around monitoring and I need, you know, I get, I'm thinking about MBAS and what am I going to do there? And is there an easy choice, right? And, and what do our co clients typically do? They obviously they work towards areas of low risk, right? And that's, that's one of the, the major pieces is, is trying to determine where do I have a position where I can keep my my risk low, but still have, you know, and low in terms of, um, in terms of having, being a little bit future proof, low in terms of um, being able to find resources, right? Who know that skill set, um, low in terms of being able to um, have assurances that when challenges come up, there's a team there to be able to solve those. And, and it's not that Microsoft is the best in any of those cases. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. There's, no. there's you have a history and baggage in each of those, but still it's, um, low risk turns into simple solutions sometimes, and that might not be the, the right one for our customers, and also might not be the right one for Axway, Accelerator, and Tony, and, and other groups. So there, there are many enterprises out there, many organizations that already have blanket services agreements with Microsoft and, and uh, discounts negotiated, et cetera, and if they if it's if they can ease this product into into the organization vis-a-vis -vis those, those relationships uh, without having to go through the entire sell cycle, uh, it does give them a leg up over some of the, some of the competition. I think we're gonna find a lot more about uh, what Microsoft's position and, and, and vision is for, for Xamarin uh, in two events coming up. Build uh, at, the end of the, at the end of March and uh, the Xamarin Evolve event in Orlando at the end of April. 
build is already sold out. You can get on a waiting list if you want to go to build in San Francisco. But um, you know, if we really want to learn more about about Xamarin and 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 how Microsoft uh, is really going to transform it or push it or you know what they're going to do with it, it may be it may be a good idea for for us to send a representative there to the uh, to the event in Orlando. Yeah, I think to Tyler's point, a, a lot of organizations um, already have Microsoft technology, already have Microsoft skill set. For those organizations, it'd be an easy sell. Like Microsoft could very easily go in and say, "We're just, we're not, we're not changing anything here. We're just adding to it and very seamlessly be able to acquire customers." And also, uh, you know, going back to the point that was earlier mentioned, I really feel that the thousand dollars a year per developers per seat is, is going to go away. I think Microsoft is, is going to either make it uh, kind of $99, just like the Apple does, and, and compete in, in that manner so that they can get a lot more companies, get comfortable with, with their platform, and, in the, and even lower the cost for, for other developers you know, who, who were initially finding this to be ridiculously expensive. What what effect do you guys think this is going to have on enterprise mobility as a whole? Like, do you think that companies that have so far been holding out on maybe making the leap in you know into mobility will will be encouraged to do so by this acquisition? I believe initially they will be encouraged to do it. I believe that uh, when they actually start uh, you know biting into the apple and finding out that enterprise mobility is as difficult and challenging as it can be. Uh, there may be some who, who, who uh, meet with some discouragement, and um, that probably spells opportunity for companies like ours to help them, help them through that and help them uh, overcome some of those hurdles. Um, I don't know if it will it will transform the enterprise landscape into, you know, a whole bunch of companies that all of a sudden now are doing mobile and doing it well. I think that we see, and we from Propelix point of view have uh, seen that. Um, just getting a, a good tool set and uh, running out and starting to build software is not necessarily a good mobile strategy. And hence, we you know, spend a lot of time with our customers and talking about their mobile strategy and, and actually you know, determining what is good and what uh, is not in terms, of, in terms of what their efforts are going to be. And uh, I don't see this play really changing that aspect of it. In fact, it might make that aspect of it even even more difficult for some enterprises uh, because they're, they're, they may be an assumption that, hey, it's going to be easy as throwing together some Windows Forms apps or some uh, simple ASP.NET uh, web apps. And, uh, and, and then when they find out that it, it's still difficult and challenging and there are still you know, all of the things that have to be solved and all of the, the, the challenges that we help our customers through, uh, all of those challenges still exist with or without Xamarin. Um, so it, it could spell opportunity for us, actually, I think. Yeah, the, other, the, other, the only thing else we were thinking about earlier was, are there organizations out there that have been primarily building um, hybrid applications because they haven't really had a good IDE that matches to their team skill sets? And so do we have situations where we've had a lot more container wrapping apps or we've had more web applications built where you know we have a uh, MS driven, Microsoft driven team, we want to be able to do some enterprise mobility, but we're not going to retrain them or we're not Xamarin customers today. And would that allow them to move away from, you know, kind of web hybrid apps more towards native applications now that that skill set is being brought under, a, you know, native Microsoft stack type of idea. So I'm not sure, you know, we, we obviously talked to a lot of people about native versus hybrid versus web type applications and, and the resources, the skill set and the ID definitely plays a role or the development environment clearly plays a role in, in some part of that decision, but maybe not the entire decision. Well, I think we're just about out of time here, guys. Any final comments? Let's go to Orlando and learn more. All right, let's do that, Eric. Florida? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think wrapping up, I'm not sure if this is a, any, uh, there's no bad, I don't see really a downside to this from a Microsoft perspective. I think it's something that like we said, we expected a while ago, and and it seems to be an extremely wise purchase. I think it's good from the Microsoft development community and those types of things. I think it is um, a step forward for an enterprise mobility perspective, like we talked about, and I think it does um, it does change the landscape a bit um, when it comes to looking at MEDPs um, for sure. And and I think it's going to be 
interesting to see kind of where this goes. It, it, it makes me have a lot more clarity in terms of Microsoft's kind of approach and, and strategy going forward as an organization. Um, you start looking at the steps that are being taken, like the, you know, re-platforming of a Visual Studio and the Xamarin purchase, other types of things, and what we talked about earlier in terms of moving away from the OS. So it's going to be it's going to be fun to watch, and it's going to be uh, I think it's good it's a good thing for our clients too. It's a good option for for large enterprise businesses, and it, it brings some um, some gravity to the enterprise mobile space. Yeah, I think I think uh, in the past where Xamarin was. Uh was not on the table in, in a lot of conversations when we were talking to our customers, even though their in-house skill sets for .NET, there wasn't a strong tool out there or, or a tool that we could confidently recommend. I think, I think now that that conversation definitely has, uh, has changed a bit. Yep. Agreed. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, once again, you know, Microsoft purchase of Xamarin uh, helping to bring increased legitimacy to uh, to enterprise mobility on the whole and making making enterprise mobility even more more of a an enriched space. All right. Well, thanks, Eric, Glenn, Nitin, and Tyler for for hopping on for this roundtable discussion. And thanks everyone for tuning in. And uh, stay tuned for the next episode of Device Squad the Propellix Enterprise Mobility Podcast. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.